Hi everyone, and uh, I guess this is lecture eight. Um, same day, I just moved upstairs. I uh, just wanted to get a bit of different lighting. All right, so today's lecture is going to be basically a um, it's going to be a summary of chapters eight to ten of the Canadian Practical Stylist. Now, I didn't ask you to to buy that. I'm just letting you know that. If uh, you see a page reference or something like that, that, that that's the only indication. I just want to let you know, yeah, that's where it's coming from. So today, this lecture is going to be more of a review of stylistic things that are a bit more sophisticated. Remember, we're moving towards your final paper. Okay, so lecture eight and then lecture nine, I'm going to be doing the same thing. I'm going to be showing you things, how, how to sophisticate your writing uh, to get a better grade, basically. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin at the very beginning. Okay, we're going to start at the basics. Let's look at, and I, I know for some of you, some of you won't even need to worry about much in this lecture. All right, if you're getting A's, you're fine. I'm trying to show the people now, okay, the students now, who are, who are still having difficulty in terms of putting sentences together properly, avoiding certain problems. And again, there's only like, like nine or ten problems that almost every writer has. If you simply avoid those problems, you, your writing will improve. You'll see. Um, believe me, you'll see at the end today because I'm going to be repetitive. Now, I'm not quite sure how long the lecture will go, only because I noticed that uh, the, the font is quite large in this lecture. I don't know why. So even though it's six pages, I have a funny feeling it's only going to be about 40, 45 minutes. But we'll see. Okay. So let's start with a simple sentence. Uh, I know, I know. Uh, like some of you are thinking this is so juvenile, so so like 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 simplistic. A simple sentence, okay, will deal with things called subjects and verbs. Okay, okay, you all know that, right? So the key, and I, I, I I've said this a thousand times, the key in really effective writing, if if you're still struggling. Keep the action of the sentence at the beginning of the sentence. All right? So, take a look at my very simple, simple example. John hit the baseball. John. Okay? That's the subject. What about the subject? Well, the subject did something. In this case, hit. Doesn't really matter what the subject hit, right? And whatever that is becomes the object. So do you remember when we were talking about modifying, right? The problem with subjects and objects and all of that. I, I don't think I really elaborated too much on that, but this is exactly what I'm talking about here. As long as you've got that subject near the beginning of the sentence, then you're going to be fine. Guess what word I'm going to be bringing up again today? Gerunds, okay? We'll, we'll come to it in a moment. So now let's look at then now, now, as I said, we're getting a bit more sophisticated. Let's just look at different types of sentences, all right? We have what we call compound and complex sentences. The compound sentence is the most simplistic way of putting a sentence together. And so take a look at your notes there, right? It's simply, and this is where you want to, you're going to want to fall asleep, all right? You're going to want to fall asleep because I'm going to be using words that maybe, you know, seem foreign to you, but I'll, I'll make them simple for you. So a compound sentence, okay, links simple sentences or, or clauses or what have you with something called a coordinating conjunction, <laughs> right? You just went to sleep, right? Okay, coordinating. If you coordinated your outfit, right? If you coordinate your outfit to go out, right? What does it mean? It simply means everything works together. That's it. That's it. A conjunction is simply a connective word. Remember about four lectures ago I said, I'll, I'll talk about that later on, okay? Well, now we're talking about it. A conjunction is simply a connective word. Now, there's different ways we can connect, all right? But for the compound sentence, the most common word to use, who's your daddy? Remember, who's your daddy? It's and. And so, take a look, all right? The compound, okay, coordinates, right? All, everything goes together. It treats everything on the same level. So if you have the word and in your sentence, like if you're connecting things with the word and, everything is working together. It's all smooth, right? So what's the example I have here, right? Remember, remember I said when we were children, okay, there's the example. We had ice cream and we had cake and whatever. 
So, in other words, everything is smooth, everything goes together. Then, and this is where we get into diff like, this is where we can get into difficulty when it comes to sentence structure, when it comes to writing, like, like <laughs> something called, and it's called a complex sentence. Now, don't get me wrong. Eventually, we all want to be writing complex sentences. I mean, that's what makes our writing interesting. But if you're struggling, okay, especially with this course, then be aware of what I'm about to talk about. When we start writing complex sentences, okay, now remember the, the compound, everything works together, okay? Compound interest, if you're, if you're earning compound interest, you're earning, in, you're earning interest on interest. In a complex sentence, okay, all of a sudden now, things are working on different levels. All of a sudden, the word and doesn't apply. And so, let's take a look now. The complex sentence, okay, I, maybe I shouldn't use the word hooks, okay, but, but, but that is the way, like, that is actually the way it works. It hooks lesser clauses, okay, or sometimes sentences, onto the main sentence. And so, words like that, which, who, right, etc., okay, um, or words like although, because, remember we talked about those in lecture two, right? So words like all, where, when, after, if, you've got the examples there in your notes. When we have words like that, all of a sudden, okay, things aren't necessarily, work, they're not working together. So the complex, the complex subordinates. So again, don't worry about the word. It's a big word. If I am your subordinate, what does it mean? It simply means that I am below you, okay? In terms of the hierarchy of a company, if I'm your subordinate, that means you're my boss, I am below you. So think about it. The subordinate clause, right, works on two levels. Here am I here, here are you up here. That's all. And so think about it. If you have a word like, um, we, had, we had a great time, okay? So positive, right? Positive. Although... And the minute you have a word like that introduced into your sentence, right, then that's where you have what we call a complex sentence. So things aren't working all in the same vein. So we had a great time, although some found fault with the decorations. See what I mean? Two different levels. So as I said, if you're getting C's right now, you want to be careful creating complex sentences. But the better you get at your writing, you do want to be creating sentences like that because it makes your writing more interesting. Okay, so so as I said, these are the kind of things that that you know. I, I, again, I wish I could give you fairy dust and say, all right, there's the answer. You have to work on these things, but there is the idea right there. So yeah, so compound and and is your friend. Okay, complex. Well, then that's where you start to get into words like although, because you know whatever. All right. Okay, so I think we get that idea. Yeah, like I said, because because the font is so large on this, I have a funny feeling we might only be about half an hour, right? So, anyway, okay. So that takes us then in terms of style, right? If we're if we're looking at different ways of putting sentences together, well then we also want to think about modifying. Now in English, mo modifying works very differently in English than it does in many other languages. If your first language is French, okay, you'll you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about, right? In French, for instance, you have words like de, la, okay, or le, like like of the or whatever, okay, and so modifying works very differently. In English, okay, we have things called dangling and misplaced modifiers. Modification meaning like like you're trying to relate to or refer to something else in the sentence. But if we have problems with modification, then what happens is sometimes we will actually modify. Remember the example I just had with John hit the baseball. Okay, remember the baseball was the object. Sometimes what we do in in in, in sentence construction is we will think that we're modifying the word John. We're referring to John. When in fact, the way we set up the sentence incorrectly, we're actually referring to the baseball. You'll see what I mean in just a second. So that's what we're talking about here, right? Again, gerunds. <laughs> here we go. Once again, like I said, 10 things to fix in writing and then everything gets better. So we have dangling modifiers and we have misplaced modifiers. 
Now, a dangling modifier, I, I don't know whether or not I want to get to the whole definitions, like, like it's pretty straightforward stuff. A dangling modifier is simply, right, there it is, a word or clause that modifies a word, another word, right, but is not clearly stated in the sentence. In other words, you, th you think you're modifying one thing, but in fact, no. You, the way you set the sentence up, you're actually referring to something else. And it, it can be confusing. In fact, okay, I'm going to go off the notes now. A dangling modifier can also be an example where you actually are missing words in a sentence, as I'm going to show you in just, just a moment. All right. So a dangling modifier, yeah, basically, it, it, like, like you're missing stuff or, or actually that's the most common. I don't want to confuse you. All right. That's the most common where a dangling modifier simply means you're missing words. Now, and that, yeah, there it is right there in the, uh, in the notes. And so here we go again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to repeat myself. Guess what type of words, okay, create dangling modifiers, gerunds. So if you don't know what a gerund is by now, you're not doing well in this course because it's, it's like I've said it, I don't know how many times. Gerunds are those ing words, right? Ing words, and especially where they're near the start of a sentence. Get rid of those. There are two of you in my group that I, I <laughs> I've told you 20 times, like, get rid of those words, all right? Shape up your sentences. Change up where the, the order of the subject is. Don't back into you know, the, the subject matter, okay? Begin strong. So get rid of those ing words or gerunds, okay? And so let's take a look then exactly what I'm, I'm talking about. Remember what I said earlier about modifying and all that? Let's just take a quick example, right? Okay. If you name the appropriate, okay, doer, terrible word, but doer of the action, okay, as the subject of the main clause, okay, in other words, near the beginning, you should be fine. When you don't, that's where we get into problems. So let's take an example right here. Having arrived late for practice, everyone look at your notes now. Don't look at me. Okay. Having arrived late for practice, comma, a written excuse was needed. See, that's the kind of thing that gets us into problems, right? This is, it's a very common first year mistake. And again, I'll bet I, I, I'll bet I did it as well. I'd be, I'd be willing to bet that I probably did it as well. So what's the problem here? Well, notice, having arrived late for practice, a written excuse was needed. Well, and again, I don't want to confuse you, so, so, so like, just hear me out. If I write it that way, well, then the thing that arrived late for practice, if I write it that way, was the written excuse. That makes no sense whatsoever. Agreed, right? We agree? Okay, so let's fix this. I'm gonna do two things here, right? And we're gonna shape this into a much better sentence. But notice, notice, how did we start that sentence? We started the sentence with the word having. Haven't I said that a hundred times in this course and some of you are still doing it, right? Get rid of words like that, right? Get rid of words like that at the beginning of your sentence. Now. Like, again, if you really know what you're doing with this stuff, all right, yeah, sure, you, you, you can just dismiss what I'm talking about. But for those of you who are still struggling, get rid of words like that at the beginning of your sentences. That It gets you into so much trouble, right? And so let me show you exactly why. Not only do you need a comma in this sentence, right? But now we don't know what the subject is, okay? Or, or at least I should say our modification is off because we think our modification is proper, but it's not. Right. So, as I said, in this case, the written excuse is what's what's basically being late for practice. OK, so that's obviously not what you meant. OK, so the question becomes then who arrived late? OK, was it the written excuse? No. So let's revise to begin with for those of you who are really good at this stuff. But then let's revise again for those of us who maybe have some troubles. Having arrived late for practice comma, so we still need that comma there because we started with the having, the captain of the team needed a written excuse. Okay, if that's a bit better, right? I think you would agree, that's a bit better. But we still have problems in terms of expression, 
punctuation, right? Like, in other words, we still have to be wary of punctuation. Okay, let's fix this. Okay, for God's sakes, let's fix this. Let's go back to the first minute of this lecture. What did I say? Keep the action at the beginning of your sentences. Subject, verb, object. Like the most simplistic sentence structure that we have in the English language. All right? The captain of the team, right? In other words, boom, there's the subject. The captain of the team needed a written excuse because he was late for practice. Boom, done. So, some of you right now are probably thinking, okay, but doesn't, won't that make my writing a bit choppy if I'm always doing it the same way? Yes, it will. Yeah. Yeah. Are you getting C's in this course? Right? In other words, in other words, let's figure out, first of all, how to do this correctly. Then maybe if you end up getting to a B in this course, but then you start improving with other things in your writing, maybe in second year, third year, now you're getting the A's. In other words, I'm simply trying to show you here how we fix certain things. So watch out for stuff like that, all right? So sure, we could have written, having arrived late for practice, comma, the captain needed a written excuse. Okay, that's fine. But there's no need to do that. Captain of the team needed a written excuse because, and remember when we talked about comma splices and how we revise? There it is right there, right? I'm not saying that was a comma splice. I'm, si I'm simply saying there are ways that we can create or put sentences together that are simply much more effective. And there is a perfect example right there. And so, and so, basically, to summarize, right, the best way to avoid problems like that, get rid of ing words at the beginning of your sentences unless, remember, okay, they are the subject of your sentence, right? So let's go back. Remember the example I gave a long time ago? Swimming is an enjoyable activity. There's nothing wrong with that sentence at all. The sentence begins with an ing word, but what's the difference? Swimming is the subject. When you write having, that's not the subject, and that's where you get into problems. Remember, what am I doing in this lecture, and eventually in lecture nine, I'm getting you ready for the next 60% of the course. 60%. Your final paper, your final exam. These are the kind of things that we want to fix. Okay, all right. And I'm already on page three and we're only 20 minutes in. So yeah, like I said, it probably will only be about 35 minutes today. And that's fine. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the, the next few lectures might be shorter because as I said, we've done the bulk of the work already that we need to do to get you ready for everything else. All right, okay. Yeah, okay. So. Here's my favorite. I gave this one to you a long time ago. I'm on the I'm on the uh, top of page three now. So having trouble sleeping. Remember the TV helps uh, the TV helps me get through the night. And so the way in which the uh, the sentence is constructed, right? It's actually the TV that's having trouble sleeping. So again, I'm sorry to keep on about this, but make sure that you are you are referring exactly right to the whatever subject you are trying to modify. It, and, and like I said, the simplest way of doing that, get rid of those ing words at the beginning. And so instead you could have written, right, when I have trouble sleeping, at least now the I, meaning you, at least now that's at the beginning of the sentence, now everything becomes clearer, okay? There, but there are so many other ways we could have written that, that sentence, I think you would agree, right? So, but I'm not going to worry about that, all right? I'm, I'm simply trying to show you, get rid of that habit, please. And so, um, and then, and then that takes us to something called misplaced modifiers. Now that one's really straightforward, really straightforward. So just take a look here. That's basically where you have a word in the sentence and you think it's modifying one thing. So remember with, with a dangling modifier, sometimes it's actually you're just missing words. With a misplaced modifier, you've got the word in the sentence, but it's just in the wrong place, okay? So, and just take a look at the three examples that I've got here, just to show you how if I put the word in a different place, it could change. It, it does, not could. It changes the meaning of, of the, the sentence. So, again, it's a subtle thing, but just be aware of it. So, I only had enough money for the show. Meaning what? Okay. I only had enough money for the show. Meaning once I paid for the show, okay, I'm broke. Okay. Straightforward. Like, no big deal. Only I had enough money for the show. Now, all of a sudden, I put the only in a different place. Now, what that means is, yeah, 
Everyone else doesn't have any money for the show. I was the only one who had money for the show. Okay, simple. I know, I know. But again, just think about, you know, is the word in the right order? I had enough money for the only show. So notice it's the exact same sentence, all three. All three are the exact same sentence, except I put the word only in different places. Number three obviously means there were no other shows. I know, I know, I know. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I'm insulting your intelligence, right? Uh, I'm just trying to show you, be aware of those things, okay? All right. Now, it's, it's, it's amazing, though. If, like, if you do pay attention to stuff like this, you can really improve your writing, making sure that you are referring okay, to certain things. So let me just give you an example now, or at least eight, eight examples of newspaper headlines that I came across over the years. And they're, they're perfect. They're perfect for showing you how even professional writers can screw these things up. So take a look at number one. And I hope you're laughing now. Okay. That, that's a perfect example, right? Perfect example. And I'm not kidding. I, these are actual headlines I found, right, over the years. So include your children, okay, when baking cookies. Now, uh, we obviously know what the writer intended, okay? In other words, let's have a family group dynamic and we'll all bake cookies together. But that's not what's being said in that, that title. What's actually being said here, okay, you're laughing now? Good, all right. It, it means basically that they're using the children as ingredients, okay? Yes, that, that's what, the, sentence, that's what the, the headline is saying. So it, it, these are the type of things you want to watch out for. And I'm going to show you one in particular in, in just a second. Number two, okay, so I just thought that was funny. Um, it, drunks get nine months in violin case. So you can see that somehow they got drunk, they stole a violin, whatever. But what's being said there is they're going to have to spend the next nine months in the violin case. Okay. So, okay. That wasn't, that, it wasn't as funny. All right. Okay. Number three. Okay. This is exactly the problem that many writers have when it comes to modification. And I hope again, I hope you're laughing. Prostitutes appeal to Pope. Yes. No. Okay. So, Obviously, what's happening here is that prostitutes made an appeal to the Pope. But that's not what's being said. What's actually being said is, hmm, as the Pope, hmm, I like the look of those prostitutes. Okay, okay, anyway, I make a joke, all right? And then number four, okay, so, okay, so did you get number three? So in other words, we're missing some words there to make sure the meaning is correct. I hope you enjoyed that, but anyway. Uh, oh, I've got another good one coming up as well. Number four. Uh, okay. <laughs> I hope this one is clear, all right? In other words, I'm not going to say much more about it. It, it means the veterinarian is going to have sex with one of the pandas. Okay. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not making this stuff up, all right? So that's what that means. Okay, number five. Some of you might not have even been born when this happened. This is not Hillary Clinton. This is her husband, Bill Clinton, who was president of the United States. And Bill Clinton got into some trouble, shall we say, <laughs> uh, with a woman named Monica Lewinsky. Okay. Monica Lewinsky. Sorry. And um, he went on national. <laughs> the idea was that he was having improper relations with her. She was an intern. So he went on national television and he said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. No. Anyway, so the newspapers then got a hold of that when he came up with the next budget and they played around, right, with the whole idea of his budget and more lies ahead, meaning more lies ahead. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole, if anyone wants to challenge me on that, you're right, if, if you understand what I'm saying, okay? I, I don't want to lose my job, so I'm not going to say anything more about that. Okay, number six. This is exactly, this is a perfect example, right, of the type of writing that I'm talking about, six and seven, right? Six and seven. So number six, minors refuse to work after death. Now, obviously, we, we know what is being suggested here. There was obviously a death in the mine. Now the rest of the workers are suggesting that they don't want to go back to work until these safety issues are taken care of. But that's not what's being said. In the title, what's actually being said is, once I'm dead, I'm never working in this mine again. 
So again, we're missing words. We want to make sure that we're referring to certain things properly. And then maybe this is, it's really funny. In the next lecture, okay, in today and then in lecture nine, there are three or four little words you want to be very aware of. And one of them is the word by, B-Y. This is a word that creates a lot of passive sentences, but also creates problems with modification. It's, it's a really small thing. You wouldn't even think about it. But take a look there. Stolen painting found by tree. Oh, I, sorry. Should you pause? Because you're still laughing at my Bill Clinton impression. I'm kidding. All right. So stolen painting found by tree. Okay. So oh, we understand. We understand. The painting was sitting by the tree. But that's not what's being said in this headline. What's, being, what's actually being said is the tree walked around, went to the city, right, had lunch, and then found the stolen painting. So watch out, especially when you have words like by near the end of your sentences, quite often they will cause problems with modification. Okay, so, so as I said, it, it, it sounds like a small thing, just be aware of it, All right? And then finally, this one is a bit difficult to, to explain in terms of how we would fix it, Two sisters re reunited after 18 years in checkout counter. So, and again, I think now that you're catching on to this, yeah, literally, the title, okay, the headline is suggesting that these two sisters stood in a checkout line, okay, for 18 years, and then finally recognized each other. That's obviously not what you mean. So, as I said, I'm, I'm having a bit of fun with that. But be aware when it comes to modification. Am I actually modifying what I think I am? And so little, there, there's a, a certain term. I'm going to talk about it more in Lecture 9. It might even be in, no, it, uh, actually it's coming up in just a moment. All right? Yeah, it's, it's funny how my brain works. Like I know what's coming up. So let's just do a couple more things. Then I'm going to come back to just this notion of, of buy and another phrase as well. And so if you remember in uh, Lecture 7, which I just did downstairs. Remember, I'm upstairs now, it's the same day. Um, in lecture seven, remember I talked a bit about parallel construction. So again, what we wanna do is make sure that our, our final essay, like everything is working, everything is, is perfect in our final essay. Introductions, some of you work on your introductions. You're still not thinking about how I laid it out to begin with. General opening statements, sections of some sort, thesis. So a couple of you had page-long intro, uh, 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 introductions. No, you, that's way too long, right? A lot of the information you have in your introduction, if you have a page-long introduction, could probably work way better in your the body paragraphs. So, so, so don't give too much preamble. But, but when it does come to something called parallel construction, all right, take a look at the notes here. Now, notice what I have to begin with, and this is not a good example. It's faulty, okay? The woman was confident, intelligent, and knew how to, how to express herself. So notice, confident, intelligent, like boom, boom. And then all of a sudden we have a clause, more than one word. Now, remember, what I'm trying to show you here is you don't always have to have only one word, but be consistent in the way you did it. Remember the example I gave, censorship? Remember? So it, that wasn't just one word for each section. It was clauses, but I did it consistently. So now let's fix, okay? The woman was confident, so same as the other example, intelligent, and then I find the right word, and articulate, right? So we replace and knew how to express herself with articulate. Again, if you wanted to do it a different way, fine, but be consistent in the way you do it. All right. And so so that's what I meant in the last lecture when I was talking about parallel, parallel construction. The question then becomes, OK, when would I use a, like like why would I need a sentence like that? All right. Maybe my example is not perfect for what I'm about to say, but think about your sections in your final paper. When you're laying out your sections, be clear. Don't give two sentences for each section. Find the right words. And so there it is right there. OK. Boom, boom, boom. And again, I'm not saying you have to have one word. Just be consistent. Remember, again, censorship. Go back to the example I gave. Look at your notes from, from Lecture 7, and you'll see what I mean. Okay? I think it was Lecture 7. Yeah. Anyway. 
And so that brings us then to some stylistic things in the practical stylist, right? That was a bit redundant. Um, and that would be then chapter nine. So again, don't worry, I didn't ask you to buy the book. I'm, I'm just suggesting you know, that's where I'm taking this from. So now let's just talk a tiny bit about passive and active voice. Sorry, I just need to have some juice here. All right, so let's talk now a tiny bit about passive and active voice. I have talked about that throughout the term. If you remember when we did because and although, remember I suggest for transitional sentences sometimes, not a bad idea, but it does create the passive voice. Now, if you don't remember that, don't worry, I'm gonna show you right here. But, but, but for the most part, we wanna fix that. So let's take a look at a passive sentence, okay? When I say passive, you'll see what I mean. The bill was approved by the board. So at this point, make a note, underline was and the word by. Remember I was talking about by with a stolen painting just a second ago? Okay, so there's a, a, cer a certain order when it comes to setting up an English, uh, sorry, a, a, a sentence in English. And there's one particular clause which has the was and then the by. The minute that you have was and by set up that way, your writing is now passive and it's not very effective. It goes back to the very beginning Okay, when I started talking about the whole idea, right, of keeping your subjects at the beginning of the of the sentence, keeping your action, sorry, keeping your action at the beginning of your sentences. The minute you have the phrase was and by, like separated somehow in the sentence, now your sentence is going to be passive. It's not very effective. Now let's look at, you know, you, you tell me, does this not sound a lot better? The board approved the bill. So in the first example, the passive example, you're moving into the action of your sentence. In the second example, the action is at the beginning. So remember, for your final paper, everything I'm talking about now is for your final paper, right? Let's get the action at the beginning for the most part. Not always, but for the most part. To make sure that we have then what we call the active voice. Okay? So... And so there's a perfect example there, right? Make a note of that one. Like just put a little star or highlight it or whatever. Now, the next two things I'm going to show you are, <laughs> I got to admit, it, 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 I'm almost being picky, all right? But, but again, I just thought it not a bad idea to show it to you, all right? And you don't, don't worry too much about it. But there are these things called stretchers. And watch out for a phrase like to be, okay, on its own. So, he seems to be upset. So if you were to write instead, he seems upset, okay, that's fine. There's no, no reason why you need the to be, unless, of course, you are worried about a word count. And then you want phrases like that, right? <laughs> I'm kidding, but, but right, you see what I mean. But there's no need for them, okay? So, so watch out if you happen to use the phrase to be a lot in your sentences, okay? to be or not to be, all right? But if you're using phrases like that, okay, eliminate them when possible, all right? The same thing for the, the phrase use of. So his use of dialogue is effective. Right? I'm still on the notes here. Well, why not just say his dialogue is effective? So again, two little phrases. I've got another one I'm gonna talk about quite a bit in lecture number nine, right? Um, but yeah, so, so watch out for stuff like that. Now, chapter 10, again, like I said, we're probably gonna go about 40 minutes, maybe 45. Uh, chapter 10 deals with denotation and connotation. I, 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 I don't even know, in, in the classroom, I like to have a bit of fun with this because I can draw stuff on the board and whatever, we can play with it. But, but in, in general terms, like, like let's, let's, why don't we just get the definitions out of the way, all right? So denotation, uh, simply refers to the literal meaning of a word, right? I'm not even going to read the notes. It, it literally, it, it, like a de the denotative word or the denotative uh, 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 reference simply means like uh, the dictionary term for whatever. Boom. Perfect. Like there it is. I've, I've got an example of a snake. Okay. There it is. Dictionary term. The connotation. Now that's the one that becomes interesting. Connotation, on the other hand, refers to the associations that are connected to a certain word, right? Or the emotional suggestions related to that word. And so in that, in that regard, it's the connotation or the connotative meaning 
which becomes more interesting right, when it comes to language. So for instance, uh, and I'm gonna jump off the, uh, the pages here for a moment. Denotative, right? The literal meaning, okay? The literal image or whatever, that whatever the, the, you know, the word or even a sign, okay? I, I, I'm gonna give you an example a moment of a sign. It's the literal thing itself. But then the connotative, what the thing stands for. So just quickly, again, I'm going to go off the notes. I'm a bit like, like, I'm not worried about it. Let's just say you somehow were referred to as a snake, as I said. Well, in certain cultures, that would be a negative thing, right? But in other cultures, that might be a positive thing. So the denotative, the literal thing itself, the connotative, what it stands for, and when I say what it stands for, meaning, and this is my own terminology now, the cultural assumptions behind whatever that literal meaning was. Okay, or I should say the literal term was. Okay, so as I said, it could be like the denotative could be a word. It could literally be a sign. So the example that I have here would simply be something like a stop sign. So let's just say you were driving in Ontario and you know English and you see a stop sign and you know to stop, right? Okay, fair enough. But let's just say you went to Quebec, okay? And all of a sudden you come to what, what looks like a stop sign and it's red and whatever, but it says array. Well, you know what to do simply because of, right, the sign itself and what the sign stands for. So in this case, what does the sign stand for? Well, it stands for risk or, you know, uh, well, a ticket, <laughs> right? If you don't follow, and so, so it's kind of it's just kind of interesting. The, the book talks a bit about the whole idea. If we were in the classroom right now, I'd probably point to uh, the exit sign, and I can guarantee you, in any room in the university, okay, the exit sign, okay, it, the word exit would be in red. So once again, like if you need to exit quickly, danger. The association is danger. Anyway, that's how connotation and denotation work. You can, you can see now how we're, we're, we're just getting to like really uh, specifics near the end of the course. And I'm not kidding when I say near the end of the course, right? I've only got one more full lecture, okay? Uh, well, okay, two, but the, the whole notion of com comparison and contrast, I've already warned you about that, so let's not worry too much about that. Okay, so this brings us then to something that the, the textbook talks about. And you're going to think now that I'm being very liberal, but I'm not. Inclusive and non-sexist language. Now, hang on. No, no, no. When I say non-sexist, I'm not talking now about, you know, like, like as I said, being liberal, like, like neoliberal in, in my approach to things. I'm talking about phrases like, and take a look at your notes here. Have you ever seen writing where you have S slash H-E? Right? In other words, you're trying to include everyone, but boy. That just doesn't work. Or you keep referring to he or she. Right? He or she. Again, no, that's just clumsy. It, like when I say clumsy, I mean you know yourself. If you're trying to write a proper sentence and you're doing that, it just it just doesn't seem to work very well. Whenever you have that problem, write in the plural. Okay, they. So instead of writing the student, write students. And the minute you write students, eventually in your sentence, you will be able to write they, rather than worrying about, well, it, should I write he here or she here? Okay, so, so that's one easy way of getting around that. Again, I'm trying to show you little stylistic points now for the next 60% of, the, of the, the, the course, right? So these just small things, think about them, all right? We can fix little things like that. And so that takes us then uh, to really the last two things we're going to talk about. So probably another five minutes. One other thing that the, the textbook talks about um, is something called a euphemism. I'm sure most of you know what that means. A euphemism, simply it, it's a, a word that kind of masks, uh, it, 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 it lightens uh, uh, the, uh, a more offensive term or, or, or more harsh term um, um, by being polite. So for instance, um, when we speak of death, and I know that that's a pretty you know, harsh concept, we rarely say so-and-so died. 
instead, especially if we're talking about family, we would rather say that so-and-so passed away. So in other words, it, it's a lightening, it's an easier tone, if you will, of expressing something that, you know, has, has a harsher meaning. So, um, I gave you a couple of examples here only because of the way in which the world is changing right now. I gave you some corporate examples. So if you start to hear words in the media like, well, you know what layoff means, right? But downsize or right size or believe it or not, headcount adjustment or RIF, which means a reduction in force. Well, basically that means, right, people are getting fired or, and, you know, laid off, right? Realignment means the same thing. And so in the world that we're living in right now, right, I thought I'd just include a couple of things like that because that, that seems to be the way that, you know, things are going with uh, everything that's going on around us or how many millions of people, right, in North America uh, have lost their jobs and may not ever see those jobs again, right? So I just thought I'd, I'd include that. Outsourcing, of course, you know what that means, I'm sure, right? Uh, basically, uh, you know, firing local employees to find cheaper labor elsewhere. And so that brings us then to, yeah, two more things that I want to do, okay? And one thing in particular that might surprise you at the very end of the lecture today, okay? I'm going to increase your vocabulary. I'm not joking. First of all, vocabulary itself. Now, in the new Oxford English Dictionary, which is coming out in the year 2037, what? If you've ever seen, now I'm not talking about online, I'm talking about the actual hardcover copies of the Oxford English Dictionary. If you've ever seen, okay, the actual full hard copy, co co uh, hard copy, sorry, hard copies of the Oxford English Dictionary, they could span probably almost an entire room, okay, depending upon the size of the room, I guess. But but the number of words in the English language is is tremendous, right? And I know I'm going to say something about that in just a second. Um, and so they only publish the hard copies every 20 years or so. Okay. As a matter of fact, the last time, I can't even remember, it's been a while since the last time they published one. Uh, and, and they're very rare. Like, like you might find, uh, I know at the English department at Carleton, they, you, they actually have the full set and it spans an entire wall okay, of all the hard copies. There are over a million words in the English language. Now, please don't email me. If you look up how many words in the English language, right, there's two schools of thought on that. One will say 176,000, okay? I think that's the number. It might be 174. But that that's only when they include only the root of a word. Root meaning if I had a word like um, uh, ride, okay? Well, ride is the root. But then let's say I had the word riding. Well, for certain grammarians, they would say, well, riding is only... Like, like an add-on, it's, it's a, a, a suffix. The ing is only a suffix to the, the root word itself. But if we actually include riding and ride as two different words, then we get over a million words. Okay. So again, don't email me about that. But I thought I would include a selection of words that have actually come into the language in two, since 2015. Right. That's when the last one, uh, major publication came out. I'm not going to do the, them all with you, okay? You can see their bants and brain fart. I'm surprised, by the way, that brain fart actually only came into the language, in, in, like into the the accepted nomenclature, nomenclature, the language, in 2015, right? Because that term has been around for a long time. Butt dial, of course, we can see now how, like, we wouldn't have had smartphones or whatever, like, like when the last Oxford English Dictionary came out, they wouldn't have been this prominent. So now we can see why a term like that would come in. Um, yeah, cakeage, ca cafe, you can, you can look at these yourself. Hangry, I'm sure you've heard of that. Manspreading, right? Obviously. But the one I do want to point out is the noun MX. And so this is a title, and you, I, I think you should be aware of these things, all right? And just to be sensitive to uh, other individuals. Uh, it's a title used before a person's surname, okay, or full name, uh, by those who wish to avoid specifying their gender, okay? or those who prefer not to identify themselves as male or female. So it's just a, a, a thing of respect, right? I remember, I'm sure some of you are probably aware of Jordan Peterson, the professor from the University of Toronto and all. Yeah, yeah I'm aware of all that, okay? Um, but, but when it comes to things like that, just to be sensitive to someone else. And I remember one time talking to someone about this from the LGBT uh, to, to, uh, to community, 
And all she said was, well, just call me by my name. Okay, or call me by what I want to be referred to as. Well, simple as that. Simple as that. So if you ever come across that, the term is usually pronounced mix or mux. Right? So I just thought I'd add that one, right? Just as I said, in case, all right? And again, don't email me about things like that, all right? Okay, I'm, I'm just letting you, I'm giving you information. And then po pocket dial, right? You can notice these are in alphabetical order. Pocket dial, obviously, again, because of, you know, how we use smartphones now, that's coming to the nomenclature as well. Anyway, okay. So today for the, this lecture, uh, I was basically just trying to give you some tips and things to think about, right? Because as I said, we've got a lot of, a lot of grade left to, 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 to earn. Um, so think about these things for your final essay and for the exam. And then, um, and then in the next lecture, which I'll probably, I'm not quite sure when I'll do, um, but in the next lecture, I'm going to do more of stuff like this, right? So uh, as I said, for, in terms of the, like the actual essays and stuff like that for structure, you've got all you need. Now it's just a matter of let's just fine tune things. I think that's what it actually says in the course outline. So what I want to do today at the end, now that we're going to wrap things up, yeah, 45 minutes, I thought it would be a bit shorter, but anyway, I want to increase your vocabulary. Okay, so give me five minutes. Okay, and I'm not kidding when I say this. Let's just say I was downtown at the courts, okay, on Elgin. I was in court, okay. For reasons for which are not important here. That was a joke. Anyway, and let's just say I was watching the judge and I noticed that she was disinterested. So now usually in, like in a large classroom, I would ask, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And most students would say, that's a bad thing. Well, in fact, that's a good thing. Okay. Notice what the word I used. Disinterested. I did not use the word uninterested. Dis mean that the, there's something called prefixes and suffixes. I don't want to get too complicated. I'm just trying to show you how you can increase your vocabulary very quickly. The prefix dis, like the, 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 the three letters before the root, right? Interested, okay, or interest. Um, that means apart, impartial, like away from. So to be disinterested means the judge is following everything, but, but does not have like, like, like a ruling interest, okay? The judge is being impartial. Now, if I had said the judge was uninterested, well, then that means un means not. UN means not. In that regard, okay, that would be a problem, right? Not interested. Well, now that's a problem because the judge should at least be listening. As you become more proficient okay, in your writing, you will also become more proficient in your vocabulary. Like that just makes sense, right? Like the more we learn. The more... So what you want to do is actually start learning. It's up to you, like, but I'm just giving you some, like, just some free advice. Not free, right? Okay, right. Learn your prefixes and suffixes. And I'm going to attach a file, okay? You'll, you'll have it by now. You'll have it by now. I'm going to attach the file, okay? Which is only a small example of what I found, right? I just, I just cut and pasted something to show you all of these different, you know, the word by, B-I, uh, sorry, yeah, B-I, right? Uh, by, bicycle, bisexual, two, 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 uni, right? One. And it just goes to show you all the... So believe it or not, if you just learn prefixes, even if you just learn prefixes, okay? Don't even worry about suffixes. You could increase your vocab... You could double your vocabulary almost overnight, right? So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, send that with the notes just so you have that. And uh, otherwise, yeah, that's another, another hour almost. Well, 50 minutes. So... Um, that's lecture seven and eight that now and um, sorry because I'm thinking about doing all this in the same day and then uh, yeah so I'll be getting work on lecture nine pretty soon so anyway have a, a great day and we'll be talking to you soon I didn't know how to end that all right you notice that okay bye